Um, started your session because uh, they're, they're all in now. We're uh, all in. Um, having so. a few technical diff difficulties this morning. So let me kick it off. Uh, we're here this morning to discuss uh, AI and the trust that we have in AI. So I've got Luca uh, and uh, Clara joining me, and I think there's two others um, trying to find their way through the machine to, to, to get to us. Uh, so let me introduce myself. Uh, Rob Leslie is my name. Uh, I am based in Ireland. Um, I run a startup um, where we're build, building um, a platform uh, using uh, some advanced cryptography and a little bit of AI, not too much, but a little bit um, at the core, in order to help organizations uh, use their data uh, more effectively. Um, the cryptography is used in order to um, preserve people's privacy um, so that I can join uh, information held across multiple different organizations in, in a manner where um, that information is never shared, but I'm still able to extract uh, value or insight from it. Uh, an example could be um, I have a hospital, a doctor's clinic, a pharmacy, and maybe an insurance company. Um, they all have pieces of my health record, um, and they would like to uh, compute something about me, whether a drug might be suitable for me or unsuitable for me. Um, and then we, we use the, the cryptography essentially to create secure communication channels between the different organizations in order to determine whether uh, an outcome um, or, or a result of some kind is appropriate. Um, we apply some AI to this. Um, but not a lot yet. Uh, we were, we're still at the first phase trying to figure out uh, have we got the right person, for for example, in all of these different organizations? And if we have, uh, then can we build a computation that preserves the privacy of, of the individual, the integrity of the data, um, and producing a result of some kind that is of use uh, to the organization that wishes to consume it? So I'm really looking forward to the conversation this morning. I think AI is one of those things that can... Um, create a lot of uh, emotions in people when you start to to talk about it. Um, I think the, there's probably three or four things that, that uh, I would like to touch on. Um, obviously, the, the big one is data, uh, how, we, uh, how we collect data, how we use data, how we uh, curate that data, um, how we train our AI systems um, so that we're able to learn uh, as we go. Um, Ultimately, I think as well, um, not forgetting that we're humans um, and that humans should maintain um, the role of the responsible um, arbiter at all times. Um, I, I don't think it's uh, good that the machine ever should, should take over. Um, <clears throat> we should be in charge. We should know what's going on and we should be the responsible ones. Um, and I think it's very important as well that uh, just coming back to the point I made about data is that we don't overvalue our data. Um, there's an awful lot of really bad data out there. Um, and assuming that all data is equal uh, could be a very dangerous thing. So uh, at some points during during the next 40 minutes or so, I'd love to touch on these things and, and see what other people's thoughts on, on these are um, and dive deeper a little in, into them. So with that, let me hand over to Clara, maybe, um, and, and uh, let you introduce yourself to everybody. Thank you. So my name is Clara Neppel. I'm the Senior Director of IEEE Europe. Uh, so IEEE, um, for those who don't know it, it's the world's largest technical association in the world. Uh, so basically, our members are um, engaged in um, technology development at different stages from design, uh, research to standardization. So probably all of you are using now one of our most known standards, the Wi-Fi standard, which we are developing with a community of 10,000 uh, individual contributors. Uh, we are also a very old organization, so we were um, founded by Edison and Tesla uh, more than 100 years ago, and uh, we evolved also uh, covering the technology from electrical engineering, uh, which is in our name in IEEE, uh, to uh, blockchain, uh, AI, and uh, different application areas such as uh, healthcare, um, autonomous driving, and so on. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm a computer scientist. I'm also... Um, uh, looked into this matter from different angles before joining IEEE. I was also at the European Patent Office. So I'm also very interested in the 
and the uh, nature of ownership when it comes to to AI and also uh, accountability and transparency, which are also very interesting. And of course, also how to establish. So this is really the important thing, how to establish trust by uh, developing and deploying uh, technology in a, techno in a trustworthy manner. Thank you. Well, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I apologize for the... Uh, yeah, unfortunately, we have some issue. Uh, so people are going in and off. So I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll take from... I think from there. So I'm, I'm Luca, um, and Luca Veres, your co-founder of Prophecy. Hello, everyone. I'm very glad to be part of uh, uh, this event and, and this panel. So um, I'm the CEO co-founder of Prophecy, and um, at Prophecy, we develop um, a neuromorphic vision sensors and system. Uh, so our vision sensor mimic the human eye. We develop silicon retina, so artificial model of the human eye. And we develop computer vision and machine learning algorithm, which mimic uh, the brain. So our bio-inspired technology is fundamentally different from conventional frame-based technology in the sense that, like the human eye, our sensor is not producing an image, is, uh, is not producing an image to be sent to the brain at uh, a fixed point in time. Our uh, silicon retina reacts only to changes as seen. When you look at me at this moment, your eyes are not sending images to the brain, but only what is changing, only dynamic information. So I started this company in 2014, uh, with uh, actually uh, first implementation of the technology for visual expression of brain, and then following the first successful introduction of the technology in the market, we started uh, looking at other fields of application where machine vision and machine learning are key, uh, like for example, autonomous driving, uh, mobile, uh, IoT, industrial, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So our approach to machine learning is different because it is bio-inspired, so we don't use uh, conventional images to train neural uh, network, but he, we use this uh, time-coded temporal information, time signature, dynamic information of object moving in the scene to train our neural network and then use model to recognize uh, object in, in, in the scene. And, uh, and, and this is very similar to the way the, the, the human brain works. So a child recognizes that the dog is a dog, not because uh, she was trained on millions of static images, but because she learned to generalize very efficiently on few uh, examples. So similar to the way uh, actually we, we do uh, with, with our technology. So um, my take about trusting machine learning uh, uh, is, first of all, in the understanding of what is trust, right? So uh, I think Bob already mentioned the fact that, uh, um, yeah, there is a, there is a bias in, in machine learning. Uh, that is due to the to the data uh, is is a quite a well known problem where we involuntarily in, introduce sometimes bias in the models typically because of the data set we are using. There is a second issue which is related to the using of machine learning for ethical purposes, right? Machine learning used for surveillance for military applications. So this is also um, a, a source of. Uh, 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 que of questions around, okay, can we trust machine learning? And the third one I would say is, uh, is the fact that we are empowering AI to, to take more and more fundamental decision. For instance, life and death decision. More and more AI, of course, is used in autonomous driving. And autonomous car need, uh, to, uh, will face situation where they need to decide whether uh, to kill an old person or uh, a young kid, right? So what will be the right the right decision. So all these are fundamental, fundamental questions that I would be happy to discuss today. Um, yeah, now I can let maybe, I don't know, Kate, if you want to take over. Or... Absolutely. Uh, I, again, I, I apologize for the technical difficulty we've unexpectedly encountered it earlier. Uh, I still don't know what uh, was the reason. So uh, please allow me to restart briefly. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome everyone at Harassi's Global Meeting. Uh, the topic of today's session is learning to trust machine learning outcomes. My name is Kate Butts. Uh, I'm a managing partner of Longevity Capital, part of Deep Knowledge Group. Uh, we focus on investing in uh, longevity industry space, with longevity being defined as living healthier for longer within currently known human lifespan. Uh, so going back to the topic of our panel, as we all know, in recent years, machine learning uh, definitely made great progress, be it uh, data processing, uh, making uh, accurate predictions or effective decision-making over broad range of applications. 
Uh, as a result, we are trusting uh, machine learning technology much more uh, and allowing uh, and, and offering it more uh, responsibility and autonomy. Uh, obviously, the uh, potential upside is huge, but with the upside, uh, you know, and, and positive transformation, definitely come the risks. Uh, uh, the risk could be uh, either a significant financial loss or even a loss of human life. It could also be uh, an important financial, uh, an important uh, decision uh, that is either obscure or difficult to interpret. So I'm delighted to be joined by four industry experts to discuss this exciting topic. Um, we have 45 minutes, slightly less now. And uh, the uh, game plan is for me to briefly introduce uh, each of the speakers to be followed by an individual talk and then a joint Q&A session. So in alphabetical order, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Rob Leslie, who is joining us from Ireland. Rob is a founder of Sedici, which using uh, a cryptographic protocol created the crypto network to facilitate the verification of identity data uh, without the need to expose the underlying data, thereby ensuring data protection. First, we have uh, doc, uh, Dr. Clara Neppel joining us from Austria. Uh, Clara is a senior director uh, of IAE Technology Center, which is the world's largest professional association dedicated to advance, advancing te technological innovation for the benefit, benefit of humanity. Uh, Clara's focus is EU uh, with regard to technology, engineering, and related policy issues. Further, we welcome Srikar Reddy, who is joining us from India. Uh, Srikar uh, is, a, um, is a chief executive officer of Sonata Software, uh, a renowned uh, global technology company uh, that enables successful platform-based digital transformation of uh, for enterprises. Amongst many other acknowledgements, Srikar has been um, uh, acknowledged as India's top 10 uh, most valuable CEOs in the large enterprise category. Uh, our fourth uh, distinguished panelist is Luca Avere, joining us from France. Uh, Luca is a co-founder and chief executive officer of Prophecy, uh, the inventor of the world's most advanced neuromorphic vision systems. Its penetrative metavision uh, sensors mimic how uh, eye and brain interact and dramatically improve efficacy in such areas as Internet of Things, AR, VR, VR and many other areas. With that, uh, in alphabetical order, I would like to pass the baton to Rob Leslie. Rob, welcome and thank you for being here. Hi, Kate. Um, just for your benefit, while, while the machine went mad uh, and, and was knocking you out all the time, uh, I, uh, Clara and Luca, I think we introduced ourselves to, to the audience. Um, I think the only person left um, is uh, Srikar. So maybe if I jump the gun and pass the baton to, to Srikar and give him the opportunity to, uh, to introduce himself, and then we can dive into the conversation, if, if that's okay. Sounds good. Perfect. Yeah, thank you, thank you Rob. I also missed your introduction because I've also been knocked in and out of the system. But yeah, glad to be here today and uh, sharing this platform with a very eminent panel and moderator. So look forward to some exciting, interesting conversations about uh, in improving trust in artificial intelligence systems. Uh, so briefly, as Kate introduced me, uh, I'm a CEO of a global CEO of Sonata Software. About uh, we're about uh, 500 million in revenue. Srika, I think your internet connection may be freezing up. We cannot hear you. Okay, well, I guess we're plagued uh, with some technological issues. So machine learning, learning definitely has ways to go. <laughs> and and, and we, I don't think that humans will be replaced anytime soon. Uh, so uh, while we wait for Srika to uh, come back, uh, come back. Um, and, while, and before we get questions uh, from the audience, uh, I would like to ask some questions for the three panelists that are currently with us. Forward and... Uh... We know that... I'm sorry, Srika, you're back. Uh, I was there. I thought you were out. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is as we okay. said. <laughs> okay, B back back to you. I, I was. Okay. I was <laughs> so, so so yeah. So as I said, so I mean, I think yeah. Obviously, the very interesting conversations about how we create trust, and I, I guess at least a couple of points. One is it depends on uh, what are the systems in which we want to create trust, and so if you say that. Uh, you're going to be treated, uh, you know, uh, uh, by an artificial or 
intelligent system which is going to cure you of cancer i'm not too sure whether you're willing to take a chance uh but if it is going to give me some investment advice on where to put my money in the stock market i may take it so i guess it's it's about where we put these systems in place and second is an uh, some kind of a uh, a transparent mechanism by which people can understand the algorithms or logic by which these decisions are being made so that there are more trust but obviously that's a different issue of you know ip and proprietary knowledge and so on and so forth so as long as that may be there and people may not be willing to trust the decisions or suggestions or whatever these systems make on on some things uh, which are extremely uh, critical to you yeah so um if i may introduce a question here unless you uh, would like to add something more speaker so we obviously know that ai ai uh, has a huge uh, potential and it could be positively transformational uh however uh, there are definitely risks as, as we've mentioned so how do we make an average person uh trust ai uh how can we make uh, algorithms more transparent what are your thoughts on that yeah as i said uh, i think question for everyone yeah obviously so so let me just quickly state that and hand it over back to my co-panelists as i said it depends on two things one is what what is it that i am making asking people to trust ai upon and how much trust do i want to put and how much risk i'm willing to take on these on these decisions and can we get can i oh yeah opex i don't know how they operate uh, then uh, not stable so uh, uh, then i think it's a challenge so 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 I, yeah i mean so i think i have a problem with my network so i land it over back to my co panelists okay so anyone else have comments on that sure i can take over so um um one one way uh, so i think that uh, <laughs> the only way to create trust uh, in technology is through humans and uh So why because AI is very context dependent. So uh you know you take uh, an assistive uh technology for instance which works very well for children uh and you try to deploy into the data sets which are used into the uh goals that uh you know that we are optimal uh AI output over time. So uh we need we will need also a continuous reassessment. And here is now also um uh well security uh, to take it to define how to um what do we mean with transparency on the technical manner because it uh, then also redefining the metrics of success uh taking into a as i mentioned before we need also this conformity assessment so the ongoing monitoring and so on of what we want actually to achieve and then verify and test thank you robin look at i i would i would agree with with a lot of the points that that clara made there um you know humans are are fundamentally irrational um uh you know we 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 make decisions sometimes that don't make sense uh yet uh an ai for example will produce uh whatever we feed it uh in terms of the data and the algorithm that we've programmed for it to produce so it will if you give it the same data and the same algorithm it will produce the same result every single time yet if you did that with a human the likelihood is you will not get the same result every single time um uh, because of the variability um that we get uh, from our experiences from our emotions from our environment um and this is something that i think we we need to think about uh in terms of how we want machines to respond uh, to to various different things um the point about you know how do you build trust uh you know trust is one of those things that takes time um you you i am naturally suspicious uh, of of anything new um i i i'm fundamentally uncomfortable uh you know talking to a bot um you know expecting that that bot is going to react just like a human would um and you know as is my nature i will be deliberately difficult sometimes when i know i'm speaking to a bot and uh, and i will just throw it a curveball knowing that i've given it an anomaly that it can't handle um and it it will break um so so again 
making sure that people understand um, that I am speaking to machine or I am into, you know, interfacing in some way with a machine um, and that the context is limited, um, I, I think is very, very important so that people can set their um, uh, perception, I suppose, at a point that is appropriate for what, whatever it is they're doing at that moment in time. I, I think as well, um, again, in relation to, to trust overall, before we start getting into life and death uh, type um, circumstances, it is really important that we go through uh, a learning curve, a growth curve in, in, in some way where, you know, we start to grow the capability from you know, a very young, mature, immature stage through the various um, life cycle phases um, before we get to the really difficult stuff. Because by doing that, you bring humanity with you. You bring people with you um, and you have the opportunity to reset if things go wrong. Uh, if you immediately jump from, um, you know, an immature technology into something that is very, very critical and crucial, um, I think if it goes wrong, um, people will lose all trust uh, and will not want to, to go near it again, just because that is what human nature I is like. So, um, Slow and steady is how I think we will win this game um, and not trying to do too much too quickly. Um, bringing the regulators um, with us so that um, the social impact is absolutely considered at every step of the way because it's going to be life changing in, in many cases. Um, and I think what the EU has done um, with the, um, the, the charter, uh, for want of a better word, um, that they've produced is an extremely uh, interesting document when you start to, to delve into it. Um, some of the things from that touch us as a company um, enormously are, you know, the, the things that are really human, you know, scanning people's faces, um, you know, emotion sensing, uh, things like this uh, are... Um, I think very, very um, important things that society at large needs needs to get their head around um, before you even start to talk about the technology. Um, because I think the technology uh, is just one aspect of what needs to be considered. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Luca, do you have any comments? Yeah, we can add a couple of comments. Of course, a lot has been already said and I fully, fully agree. Uh, of course, nobody is arguing that uh, AI is going to be the most massive uh, uh, technology and economic transformation in, in, this, in this century. Uh, it is already adding by now uh, more than uh, $3 trillion value in all applications. It's growing so fast. So, uh, uh, but the question is about, okay, can we make it grow um, in a way which is uh, acceptable and sustainable? And uh, it probably depends on, also on the applications and, and um, uh, can... can uh, um, I mean, I think if we rely on, on AI being right for the wrong reasons, uh, this will limit uh, the way this will, will sustainably uh, scale. Uh, for example, if you take an AI model that decide, I don't know, whether uh, a machine needs some, some maintenance uh, to avoid a failure, uh, if in the end we can show that um, the AI is consistently right, uh, let's say 80% of the time, while, for example, uh, with uh, human judgment, we can make this prediction of a failure 60% of the time, then, then I would say probably in this type of application, uh, I would argue that, yes, using AI, even if it, I don't understand fundamentally the reason why it's working, uh, it will make uh, sense, right? And it will be accepted. There are other cases, like, for example, cases in medicine, right? Where uh, if I'm using AI for cancer diagnosis, uh, even though the, the, my medical AI system is probably more efficient than the doctor uh, to provide um, uh, the answer. But if I'm not able to explain the reason uh, why I'm reaching, why the medical AI system is reaching this type of conclusion, I think is, is, is not going to be accepted by, uh, by the patient as much as the maintenance guy is accepting the, the AI system uh, uh, giving him 80% of the chance of the failure rather than uh, rely on, on, on human, human judgments. So I think it's important to have this um, in certain applications for sure, to have more, uh, because people sometimes point, are pointing the fact that uh, in AI we, we rely on this black box 
way of 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 uh, uh, working so probably having a, a rather a, a white box approach would be important so adding this layer of a, explainability to ai i think is important uh, to which extent is also a good question because of course we don't want to uh, 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 make um, make this model uh, because ai in the end uh, is relying on a set of rules uh, so we need to explain what are this, this set of rules. But of course, we don't want to make this set of rules too simple because otherwise then we compromise uh, the efficiency of, of model, which sometimes are, are complex. So I think in the end, it comes down to some sort of trade-off between the ability uh, to get some understanding uh, of a particular decision without needing to understand how the AI model functions, functions in, in, in its entirety, let's say. Thank you, Luca. Uh, and actually, uh, part of what you said actually pertains to my next question, because I think we can all agree that one of the most promising sectors of AI is it's used in, it's used in you know, medical decisions and diagnosis, right? So there's a huge upside here. So in your opinion, and it could be, you know, uh, Clara, perhaps you can address it from the policy angle as well. Uh, what is the appropriate um uh, interface point of AI should it be used as a, for do, uh, by a doctor as a tool? Should it be uh, in the hands of the patient or health system as a health manager, a risk manager? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So I think uh, you know it it will be used everywhere. <laughs> it will be used everywhere where it makes sense. And I think what is important now is really to uh, have also a consensus again for that patient group on what we want to achieve. Uh, I th now we I'm, I'm just taking the example of wearables. We all have now our phones and other uh, devices which measure, for instance, steps. Do we know actually what a step is? Did we def define it? Is the step something which is the same, you know, for me or somebody who is uh, maybe physically uh, challenged? Uh, however, these kind of data uh, are also the input for the AI system. So before doing this, we really need to make consensus on a technical level. What do we mean with a step, for instance, just to make make sure that uh, that the system is accurate. So this is one of the things that we need to take into account. And then there are other things where I think we have to go move beyond the technical level and to take into account society. I will give you another example. There is now a, a software uh, which claims to uh, define criminality from people's faces mm. and with an accuracy of 97%. So it's really Perfect, what you would say. Uh, now, there are, uh, you know, scientists who show that the data set uh, is not relevant and, and so on, and it cannot work in that way. But you can always just take a step back and say, well, this is phrenology. This is, uh, you know, a science um, which was not accepted already for some some years ago because uh, it is discriminating. It is not, you know, it's it shouldn't, it cannot work. I mean, uh, determining uh, criminality from people's faces. So we also need to take this social uh, context into account and say, what is it? What are the red lines? What is it? What we don't want to accept? For instance, do we want to accept, uh, you know, to de the AI to determine? Uh, physiological or uh, psych psychological profiles uh, for whatever activities I'm doing or my children are doing. So, and this is also where uh, you know the these uh, the uh, the governments and and uh, policymakers have to do uh, setting these red lines. This is actually what the EU was try was doing now, and uh, and working then I would say in the from the top down approach with the bottom up approach on how to. Um, you know, how to make these um, safeguards and also how to make then uh, trustworthy technology design uh, really uh, operational. And this can be through standards and conformity assessments that we are uh, working on. Uh, standards, which is, let's say, la like a recipe, which say says you if you're moving, uh, if you're doing these steps, Hopefully, you will get a good uh, product, and you need then, uh, let's say, the uh, Michelin who would look into the product and say, "Well, this is now actually, you know, it's, it's conformity assessment gold." Or <laughs> and and this is um, this is a way also. So conformity assessment is one of the bases to um, to provide trust into uh, for the uh, for the average citizens, as we see in the nutrition labels and so on. 
Great, thank you. And the question for all panelists. So in your opinion, uh, what is the most promising uh, sector of AI applications? We mentioned uh, medicine, uh, self-driving cars and whatnot, but uh, I'm curious, uh, what is your esteemed opinion uh, on that question as it applies to you as a professional, uh, as well as an individual? Okay, Rob, I'll pick on you. Well, I, I think... The, the amount of data that we're, we're creating and consuming at the moment is, is growing at, at an exponential rate. I, I think we're going to need uh, intelligent systems to be able to help us make sense of the data. Um, you know, I, I think as well, AI, the, the quality of an AI is, is also directly linked to the quality of the data that you feed into it. So I think what we're going to probably end up seeing is how you build training systems for um, for anything, uh, which ultimately comes back to um, a data set that you somehow come up with uh, that is optimal for whatever application you're you're seeking to um, to create, um, and then making sure that the deviation of the the raw data or the you know the data that you are capturing from whatever system it is how much of a deviation uh, exists between your, your optimal data and that other data so that you're able to address um, biases uh, or, or inaccuracies with, within your system somehow. Um, I just don't think we have uh, you know, an, enough capability today um, to be able to screen our data to the point where we're able to eliminate all the rubbish that we, we accumulate. We accumulate everything. Um, and uh, maybe we shouldn't be. Um, you know, that, that, that is most certainly one thing. There was just one point that I'd like to go back to just for a second that, that Clara raised, um, you know, in, in and around the, you know, 97% accuracy you mentioned there in terms of, you know, assessing somebody. That means three in every hundred people that assess potentially could be accused of a crime or, or something that they didn't do. Um, and I think the danger um, that, that has for society at large um, it is enormous. Um, you know, to think about you know being accused of a crime that you didn't do um, on the basis of um, a claim that a machine has come up with, knowing that there is an error rate uh, of that um, that degree, potentially, you know, if it was in a, a life and death scenario where it was a you know a murder or or some something really catastrophic. Um, could actually end up causing you to lose your own life. I mean, that that is a horrendous outcome if you think about it. Um, so I, I just think we've got to be incredibly careful uh, in terms of how we apply these things and the context in which we apply them, um, uh, which, you know, goes back to the data and the decision-making process uh, that we arrive at to get there. Well, thank you for bringing this up, Rob. I really appreciate that, and I, I agree. Uh, Srikar, Luca, do you have comments uh, on the question? You're on mute, Srikar, sorry. Yeah, I guess one needs to I mean, maybe look at this on a three-dimensional framework. One is there are systems which are being used to increase profits of corporations. So, you know, whether it's fintech or whatever it is, there are you know, all these new systems which are allowing you to trade and create new insurance products and, you know, create uh, new retail solutions or whatever. And companies are using that to, uh, let's say, increase their profits. Uh, the second is obviously where it can be used to solve deep problems of the world, uh, which whether it is uh, in, in developing countries or poor countries where there is lack of access to uh, medical care, where there is lack of access to uh, teaching, so there, that, there, I think there is a huge impact which uh, even uh, basic AI systems can make uh, in getting uh, uh, products and services and solutions to people in the world where you can't find a good teacher, can't find a good doctor. Can't, I mean, I'm, I'm sticking to teacher and doctor rather than accountants and lawyers and other stuff. But uh, so, so there's a tremendous value, I think, which uh, learning systems can provide. Uh, not really, I mean, go and cure stuff, but can do a, a pretty good job of delivering high quality stuff where there's a shortage of people, uh, distances are uh, remote, people can't access these places. But today we have most parts of the world, they seem to have some overt access to smartphones and so on and so forth. 
and third is obviously this whole thing of that you know all this ai and other things will replace most jobs in the world so then you know i guess then we have a different you know social challenge to look at uh, where when you know the lawyers or doctors or accountants or, or stock traders or whatever all are going to become obsolete because smart assistants are going to replace them so that's the third thing i mean one need to look at and think of what are the social implications of uh, of that kind of a eventuality i guess it's only a matter of time i mean uh, but i guess you know in observe we are moving towards that direction as systems become more and more powerful and you know uh, all kinds of uh, uh, quantum computing and all that things will get more and more powerful to process humongous amounts of data in double quick time and start doing stuff which a human being can't do as long as it's fairly you know predictive in some fashion you know a kind of stuff so 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 these are the three areas i would look at so if you ask me i think we should look at solving problems of the world which uh which are unfortunately uh, there are no other solutions uh, so if you can focus on that i think it'll bring a big value into the overall well-being of humanity and the world in general thank you well uh, our session is unfortunately coming to a close but uh before uh us finishing up i was wondering whether luca or, or clara have any comments on this uh, last question for this panel maybe i can add one last comment uh, because a lot has been already said and uh, um yeah i like also to see ai in a way where actually can bring value to reduce certain type of uh, inequalities right um um for example ai can be used for supporting uh, uh, people with disabilities uh, there are works around using uh, uh, brain machine interfaces for paralyzed people who can inter- interact in a better way with their environment through ai through computer there are also now uh, studies showing that um, ai can be used in the workplace uh, and they would be used more and more in the workplace in the coming decades to actually make sure that uh, um make sure that through ai we can find a more equitable uh, workplace by evaluating for example people candidates based on their capabilities uh, rather than their gender ages or or classes right so um so yeah i think uh, i think uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, there is still a way to go but um, a lot of promises Yeah so uh, from my point of view I could just agree it AI will bring benefit whenever it advances uh, humanity we already see now for instance that AI is helping us with translations which helps us with interactions globally uh, so this is already working uh, natural language processing is has superhuman um, capabilities in some uh, context and uh, for me uh, so I think uh, personally what I'm really excited about is that AI can bring really new patterns uh, up which uh, we humans did not see until now we we saw it with the go game but we see it also now with uh, discovering drugs so what is important of course i see it as as a tool for humans so that to follow up and uh, you know hopefully develop then those vaccines and and medicines and so on with uh, the input from the ai wonderful I, we're also in our company big uh, believers in ai for drug discovery it's an area of special interest and uh, for us is definitely uh, amongst the top priorities and definitely affects uh, you know uh, all humanity uh with this uh, i would really like uh, to thank everyone for attending again apologies for the uh, technical mishaps uh, that some of us encountered but it's been a true pleasure uh, it's, it's ai is an exciting uh, sphere obviously uh, a lot needs to be done uh, it has a huge potential upside but uh, obviously we need to be on the lookout for for risks and appropriate regulation uh, and development uh, and i do hope that we will have a chance Uh, to continue this discussion whether within the harassis environment or on other occasions but it's been a true pleasure thank you thank you everyone thank you, thank you all good luck take care bye thanks bye bye